Good morning and welcome to the ninth annual TIFF Doc Conference. We are in day six of the Toronto International Film Festival and very excited to be sharing this special day with you. The Doc Conference is a day-long event that is part of TIFF's industry conference. We hope that you've been able to check out some of the other programming in the conference. Highlights this week have included master classes with Aaron Sorkin, Larry Wilmore, and Armando Iannucci. And you're not too late to catch the master class with Mary Heron. To begin, we would like to acknowledge the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat, the original keepers of this land, for hosting us today and for hosting TIFF on their land every day. <laughs> My name is Dorota Lech. I'm the co-programmer of the DOC Conference, and I also work in the programming department here at TIFF. I also work at Hot Docs, where I produce the Hot Docs Forum, a two-day financing event and a co-production event for which the applications opened today. Check them out online. Yeah! <laughs> uh, at the Doc Conference, we seek talks that make news, stir conversation, and point to new directions in both the creative and business side of cinema. Past speakers include Asif Kapadia, Werner Herzog, Raoul Peck, Errol Morris, Alanis Obamsawin, Ramin Barani, Shola Lynch, Andrew Jarecki, Sarah Pauly, Naomi Klein, Michael Moore, Jonathan Demi, Steve James, and many, many more. This year's slate includes dynamic Maverick directors, including Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady, Brett Morgan, Sam Pollard, Angeli Nyer, and Denis Cote. They will be speaking about their work, sharing their wisdom, and answering our questions. Rounding out the conference, we also have the director, Morgan Spurlock, presenting his new A&E series, and sessions with Geraldine Dreyfus, as well as Peter Broderick. For the run of the day, I'd like to remind you that we have two breaks, one 50-minute break at 11.30 and one 30-minute break at 3 p.m. We also break from lunch from 12.45 to 1.45, during which our networking session, Doc Connections, happens. The signups for Doc Connections, which went online a couple of weeks ago, are now full. This is, of course, very encouraging, and we're taking it as a sign to expand the program. Now, we have very tight turnaround between breaks today and ask that if you leave, you please leave quietly. Also note that the seating is first come, first serve, so if you do, do leave, we cannot guarantee your seat when you come back. A big, huge thank you to Showtime Documentary Films for sponsoring Doc Conference and the cocktail that will follow at 5.30 in the foyer. I would like to also thank CBC and Glenn Gould Studio for accommodating us. This is one of our favorite days of the year, and we are so appreciative of the space. I also want to thank TIFF staff that helped make Doc Conference happen this year. They include Kathleen Drum, Lynn Crocker, Karina Rottenstein, Elena DeCock, Carter Bruce, Ryan Stamm, Eloise Weber, Kong Lee, Paige Goodman, Diane Capoletto, Aaron Van Domlin, Eula Shangavi, Anita Kotick, Jonah Camphorst, Vanya Caraway, Krista McIsaac, the entire front of house team, all of our volunteers, the CBC, and many more people. I hope I haven't forgotten everyone. A lot of people's labor goes into making this day happen, and we are so appreciative of it. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the founder of Doc Conference, Tom Powers. He started Doc Conference nine years ago and is also TIFF's documentary programmer. You can find him at Sundance Now and on his podcast, Pure Nonfiction. He's also a great colleague and a great guy, and you're about to see him a lot today. Let's call him to the stage. Thank you, Dorota, and thank you for, uh, to everyone for being here. Um, uh, extra thanks to our co-presenter of this next session, Public House Films. Thank you, Public House Films. Uh, so in starting off the, the day, I wanted to start with uh, some high energy, and, uh, and I think we're going to get it from uh, our first two guests, Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady. They uh, have a long uh, career in documentary films, stretching back at least 15 years. Um, their films include uh, Boys of Baraka, the Oscar-nominated Jesus Camp, Twelfth in Delaware, Detropia, and uh, Norman Lear, just another version of you. Their new film uh, at the festival is called One of Us. It is uh, set inside New York's um, uh, Hasidic Jewish community, about three individuals uh, trying to leave for a more secular life. Did anyone get to see the world premiere of, uh, of One of Us? Uh, okay, I see about, about half a dozen, maybe a dozen hands uh, up. There's another screening tonight. Um, this film uh, got extraordinary uh, reviews in, uh, in the trades uh, since its world premiere uh, two days ago. Uh, it's going to be on Netflix uh, uh, this fall. But uh, we're going to uh, get this started by um, looking at a little trailer 
uh, for one of us, and then I'll bring out Heidi and Rachel. Here's the trailer. The filmmakers, Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady. Uh, so Heidi and Rachel, we can tell just from that trailer that uh, this is a very sensitive topic. There are, you know, real serious issues at stake of, uh, for the three people that you film. And in today's conversation, I, I want to talk about navigating some of that difficult terrain between uh, with, with your subjects and you know taking care of your subjects while at the same time maintaining your your own editorial independence before we talk about uh, this new film one of us I'd like to go back to earlier parts in your career and I wonder you know what were some of the key moments in your career where you were learning how to face those challenges of uh, you know, of filming someone and and uh, and you know dealing with the sensitivity issues around what it meant to be documenting their lives. Um, you know, uh, that's something you never you're never done with that process in terms of how do you navigate because it's uh, you know it's it's an organic moving thing, depending on the person, depending on the situation, what's going on in their life. So, um, you know, depending on how you personally feel about the situation. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's one of my favorite things about this job that we picked. Um, because, you know, you're getting into the real heart of humanity when you are documenting someone's life. It's a very strange relationship. It's not a normal relationship. It's like, um, eh, kind of like, I guess the closest would be, and I hate to say this because it's not really true and it's kind of diminishes it, but it's like um, social work mm. or, um, you know, um, journalism. I mean, there's a lot of things in there and there's uh, very few rules. You know, it's not like news. There's not rules, so you are making up. And the maybe rules the as big, you, o you know, an obvious difference between news and uh, and what you do with long form documentary is the amount of time you're spending with someone. You oh, know, sure. It's one thing to walk into someone's life when they're undergoing a crisis, mm -hmm. write it up and leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I remember the first time, our first film was called The Boys of Barack. It came out in 2005. We follow a group of inner city kids from Baltimore 
uh, to Africa where they go to school, this experimental boarding school in Kenya, East Africa. It was a wild experiment that we followed, uh, a, a school experiment. And we face these issues right away. Uh, I mean, these are uh, impoverished kids, many who have never been off the block. Let's call it out of Baltimore, okay? But that's true. Um, and they lived in some of the worst low-rise projects in Baltimore, and they were children, and they were 11, and we want to follow their lives. And so you, we immediately jumped into a, a major ethical battle right there, or, or an ethical quandary, um, the first of many in our career. And it's like, you know, you don't want to do what they call the quote-unquote ghetto gazing. I mean, we were like white privileged women making a film uh, about this community. So we were very aware and sensitive about it. And, um, you know, there were roaches all over the house of one of our subjects. Um, they would be running up and down the walls uh, while we were filming. And it's like you realize in that moment what you don't include in the film is more important in so many ways than what you do include. Certain filmmakers, uh, you know, we make stumbles in our careers, would include that shot. But why? Don't we know what poverty looks like? Can't you do it with one shot? That's not the shot, mm. in, my, in our mm. opinion. Mm. So you're also dealing with children and their mothers, and some of their mothers had uh, drug issues. And who is the adult here? Who is in charge? Who gives us the authority and the peace of mind to make this film? It turned out it was us. It wasn't the parent. We, we couldn't. We had to take over the responsibility of what to include and what not. And a lot of those decisions were made in the edit room. So every single film since then, we've encountered something like that that, that we had to uh, navigate. And it's just the type of subject matter we pick. And we learned a lot on that one. Just to add one more thing to, to the boys of Baraka. Um, they had very strong accents. It was partly just the lexicon. It was Baltimore. Um, we did rough cut screenings. People didn't understand what they were saying. We said, oh my God, we cannot subtitle these kids. They are speaking English. And Sam Pollard, who was an amazing film here um, about Sammy Davis Jr., was our editing consultant. And he came in and he goes, I cannot understand a goddamn word. <laughs> um, and Sam Pollard is a black man. And he was like, you guys have to subtitle these kids. We're like, we can't do that. He goes, you have to. Be brave. What's wrong with you? Don't you want these kids to be understood? So again, you know, we're trying it's a learning to, process. It's a learning process. You're trying to do the right thing, and so it really we got hit in the face really quickly with these issues sure. on our first baptism movie. by fire. Yeah, on for that sure. One. And they didn't go away in Jesus Camp or any of the others. They got worse. Right. It, it, uh, it doesn't feel like you've been backing off these issues uh, in your career. Uh, Jesus Camp, Twelfth in Delaware, is a film. Uh, it's uh, set in Florida about an abortion clinic, and then across the street from it is a, uh, is, is a clinic where they're trying to uh, steer women away from abortions, and you're filming in, uh, in both places. Um, so uh, you must have some kind of appetite for... <laughs> that something's wrong with us, <laughs> I would say. And this, our, this latest film, the one that we have here, One of Us, was a, a whole... Started all over again, you know. I mean, um, its own unique set of incredibly high stakes decisions in terms of um, the relationship and what we were doing in people's lives when they were going through, um, in one case, the most traumatic year of someone's life, where it's just you know the stakes were incredibly high. And so uh, let's set the table for what w one of us is and, and what brought you to uh, this subject. Uh, Sh sure. Well, we're, we're um, you know, uh, we're New Yorkers and the Hasidic community, there's a huge Hasidic population in New York. So all New Yorkers have a relationship with this community, uh, despite the fact that the community doesn't want and isn't interested in having in assimilating at all. And can you describe, like, you know, what the for people who aren't New Yorkers, yeah. kind of what the history of that community is, and the ways in which New Yorkers do interact with right. it? Right. Well, um, it is. They have a. It's a fascinating um, backstory uh, and evolution of why they're in New York, but um, essentially. The almost like 99%, the vast majority of this community are Holocaust survivors, and um, the few uh, ultra orthodox Hasidic, which is a you know a, a subsect of ultra orthodox e in the Jewish 
faith, um, came to the United States to escape as refugees, the survivors. So they came with a lot of trauma, a lot of baggage. Um, you know, they, they stuck together and they rebuilt their community in, in, in Brooklyn. And became a lot more conservative in their beliefs and closed off than they were when they were living in Europe. Mm as a result of what had happened. They were not always like this. It's from the, from the 1800s. They were more of the ecstatic, Sufi-type, uh, mystical sect of Judaism, which changed a great deal once they came to the United States. There was really the concept of keeping the clothing, staying away, m making themselves a sign of, you know, we're here, you're there, just stay away from us. Um, and uh, they remain that way, and it's actually the fastest, still the fastest growing sect of Judaism. Yes, because they have big, big families, big family. and they have lots of children. Um, so, all of the rest of us New Yorkers are just curious, obsessed, see them on the subway. You know, New York is one of those places where you have to interface with everybody. Uh, you can isolate, like we all do in urban, sit everywhere, you know, we all stick in our little bubbles, but um, New York, pushes you out of your bubble more than other places just because of the density, et cetera. And so we just see them all the time and they don't seem to care at all about the rest of us. And we all talk about them and want to know what, why, why are you like that? Why won't you look at me in the eye? Why, you know, it's just, and, and I'm Jewish, so of course I'm like, do they care that I'm Jewish? Well, what does that mean to them? You know, do, do, do they accept me in a different way at all? So you begin so, with a real curiosity. With a profound about, curiosity, yeah. yes. And then um, uh, came across an article about an organization that helps the few people that leave the community assimilate into secular society. So for us, we saw a way in to the story because we were never going to go into the community proper. Mm -hmm. That's by design, that's never happening. It won't happen. Um, unless we went into like, I, I don't, there's no way we could do it. A full disguise, learn Yiddish, like it just, right. it wasn't gonna happen. Um, we did study Yiddish for a few months and we learned it. And enough. Heidi is fluent, cause she's, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, actually Alex, our associate producer almost became fluent. Uh, so, um, but Footsteps was our so, access so point. So yes, and then, you know, it took us a while to get access to Footsteps. Oh. Uh, it's obviously a very niche organization because very few people leave less than 2% of people leave. So uh, describe that interaction to me. So Footsteps is an organization trying to uh, help people, like, y you know, they may not really need a filmmaking crew around sure. at this incredibly sensitive time of people's right. lives. And a lot of people have, have um, approached them over the years because it's a, you know, no-brainer as a storyteller. Right. Um, there's intrinsic stakes. You get to learn about this community that you have no access to. Um, there's just a lot of reasons why. Well, that's an interesting point because I, I think these days we're, there's so many storytellers, so many documentary storytellers yeah. uh, out there that probably any organization that uh, you know advertises itself as a dramatic place is uh, is getting calls, and the you know the difference between the people who just get turned away and the people who persist. And, uh, and get to tell that story is that it's a meaningful one. And access, access is everything. As filmmakers, we all know this. I mean, to like step back for a second, Rachel and I obviously only make films once we've got, we've secured an access that we think is special and, and that other people can't get. So um, walking up to people on the subway and saying, are you thinking of leaving the Hasidic community was not gonna be our development process. It's not gonna work. Yeah. So it took us six months for Footsteps to vet us and decide and talk to their board and look at our films and hear us out and, and allow us to come in to Footsteps without our cameras and hang around. So, so I'm we really can cast people. I'm interested in this because, you know, you target this, you think it's an interesting place. At the same time, you've got other projects uh, to do. You, as a filmmaker, you have to like, learn how to budget your time. You know, all of us as filmmakers have had the experience of like, spending months going after something and then just realizing yeah, there's, there's a no there. sale there yeah. and, uh, and you don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about how uh, you you know, made the deliberate choice to keep pursuing this? Mm -hmm. You know, did, were there points where you thought about giving up or what was it that kept you going? Bless you. 
Well, we were already working on a film, Norman Lear, Just Another Version of You, and that was in post-production while we were developing this. So we already had a job that, you know, a paying film that we had to execute, so that was helpful. Um, and we also were able to get a grant from an individual to develop the Hasidic movie, Regina Scully, and without her, she's like an angel to documentary filmmakers, without her we would never have been able to stumble and, and have all these obstacles. So the combination of having another film in production and, uh, and this grant allowed us to explore, cast, and see if there was a movie there. And we didn't go pitch it to anyone or like call a network or tell anyone we were making this movie because what if we didn't get anywhere? What if we didn't, couldn't do it or pull it off? And you, we don't want to make these promises. So we had this cushion of time to go out on our own without telling anyone what we were working on and see if there was a movie there. And that really, by the time people got a whiff of it and started calling us and asking about it, the different distributors, we actually had something to show at that point. Mm. But we didn't go out and advertise that we were doing this because we might have failed and why talk about it? Mm. Uh, and that is actually why she is an angel investor and there are these angel investors, meaning people that will give you money that um, no one else wants to because it, of course everyone, it, it's a lot more appealing to fund a project that is you know is gonna be good right. and that right. it's almost done. So this is finishing like, funds are the, finishing funds. Yeah. yeah, I mean, which we want. Obviously, right. we have to finish the movie, but um, nobody wants to give first but, money. But there, we, you know, over the years, there've been people that give us, you know, trust us or give us the 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 leg up to develop something, and um, thankfully, they've always the ones that there's been two or three that we've had that opportunity and they've gone somewhere because mm. you'd feel obviously horrible if you're wasting someone's money. Yeah. But, um, you know, if anyone's in here that wants to do it, um, <laughs> <laughs> they're really valuable people that, and people that believe in you before, you, when you're coming up with the concept. So what do you think it was about your process that won over footsteps compared to anyone else who had approached them in the past? I think Jesus camp, I, I do. I think that, um, you know, obviously, so you make films for a while, we've made all these movies, and your body of work can work for you or it can work against you. Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes coming in as a blank, blank slate, people trust you more mm -hmm. and you've got no track record and that's actually an asset. And sometimes your body of work helps. Mm -hmm. And in this case, I think the fact that we made this film about, you know, um, young children being raised as fundamentalists, um, with no choice in the matter, uh, you know, in America, set up. I mean, there's there's similarities. Obviously, there's differences, but there there's there's um, there were enough similarities that they understood that we were going to be um, thoughtful about it, and um, that we understood some of the landmines of being raised in this way, and what the, what people end up on the other side being like, very fragile, and a lot of times. Um, you know, it's incredibly, you feel insecure going to a world that you've never been in, you don't speak the language well, you haven't been educated, you, the sexes have been separated, uh, you've never been to a secular library, you've I mean, it's like, it's, you're, you're getting dropped down onto planet Earth from a different planet. So, um, you know, there's, the, the people there are, the, their members, the Footsteps members are vulnerable. So they have said no to a lot of people because they don't need the press. I mean, they don't need, but for, we convinced them that they did and that it would be good for them and that, um, you know, they would get something out of it and their members would get something out of it. And they said yes. So then Heidi and I spent six months hanging out in their lobby. <laughs> so that's what they gave us permission to do. Without is, a camera. No without camera, a camera, no just, camera. you know, sitting around and waiting for people to come in. Um, and approach them and tell them what we're doing, and obviously they make their mind up for themselves. But. And so when you say six months hanging out in the lobby, I mean... It, Not every day. Right. But uh, a lot. It, I mean, it's, is, it's right down the street is, from our work, so... Is it, um, is it that, like, footsteps will call you up and say, hey, someone is coming in at 4 o'clock today? No, they would say, we're having this event. It's like a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, which I think is where we met Etty. Actually, Etty, sorry to do this too. Etty's in the audience here, um, um, okay. right there, yes, Etty Aush. <laughs> so this, she's uh, our main subject of the film. <laughs> and uh, since we're 
I'm looking at you, and we're talking about footsteps. Uh, we met at, was it a Thanksgiving? It was some event. Yeah, and uh, I saw her across the room, <laughs> and I noticed she was wearing a wig, and she was dressed from, she was dressed modestly. And I, a lot of people who come to footsteps are and aren't. I mean, not everybody, some people are still in the community and just checking it out quietly, and people at home don't know where they are. And uh, I approached her and we started uh, talking and uh, it led to another conversation, another and a meeting and all of those things where we explained ourselves. Um, so just the ability to be in the room was, was, was the gift in itself that Footsteps gave us. But also you always have to figure out what an organization is looking for. They didn't need the press, but they had arrived at a point where they, might, they were thinking maybe it'd be nice if more people knew about us. It's only word of mouth. So they were also arriving in a moment where they're thinking, have we plateaued? How do we get more members? How do we find, how do people know about us? And so I think they were arriving at that moment when we arrived, and at some point we said to them, if you give us access, this movie will be seen. We will guarantee you a wide audience, because all of our films get seen. So if that's appealing to you, if you're going to bet on a horse, and you like our work, you should probably go with us, because we will get the movie out there. And I can t say that with confidence now. And that helped. Because they're like, well, if we're going to do it, we might as well get it seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might as well, like, go for it. So, you know, you, the conversation kept shifting. And um, they really took a leap of faith. And so did every single person who agreed to be filmed. And that is a whole different conversation about that, that responsibility. So, uh, Etty's story, which we've seen a little bit of in the trailer, we uh, see her calling the police uh, when family members are beating on the door, uh, you, you get a sense of the, the real stakes and seriousness mm -hmm. of the situation that she was going through for months and months uh, while you were following her. Um, uh, and there's something interesting that happens in the film, which is that early on in the film, when you're filming with her, we don't uh, see her face, and gradually as, as the months go by, we see more and more of her as her kind of confidence is growing in, um, in, in representing herself more as, uh, as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about, if, you know, at the early stage when uh, you were filming with her and, and there's, you know, a lot of, um, you know, high drama um, uh, going on, uh, you know, what that process was like for you, you know, like how you interacted with her, how you stayed in touch with her, how you were able to be there for um, these really tense moments. You know, um, this kind of comes circles back to what we were saying initially, which is um, your responsibility to your subject, et cetera, and you know how that changes, et cetera. So this film um, was totally different than anything we'd ever dealt with because our main subject was being, you know, stalked and harassed and was in danger and was having, honestly, a horrible time. And we were filming it and there was the dual thing, it was very strange, it was, you know, Again, getting back to that weird relationship you have with someone as, a, as you're documenting their life and are you, you're not really their friend, but you're not really not their friend and what is this relationship? In this case, it's, it's someone who does not have a lot of other resources, someone exactly. who's lived in a very closed community and is now you know, separating from that community Correct. And, right. and has made some contact with you you're one of the few right. resources they have. We were kind of like, um, you know, a little bit of a lifeboat in a way, you know? And um, so it was just extra, extra something, you know? Um, she was recording all of her phone calls. Since before we met her. Yes. Since so, um, you know, it's, the whole time, it was, it's, it's kind of, I still am processing the whole thing because it reminded me of when you hear about someone that has identity theft or has an illness that no one believes. And the feeling, you know, when you're hearing about this, how it 
makes your blood boil and how frustrating that would be and how that's everyone's worst nightmare that suddenly something is happening to you and you're invisible, no one cares and no one believes you. So that was essentially happening to her and we were filming it. So there was something about that that we were like, we cannot mess this up. We have we, to get we, this we, out this here. This is like, this is like yeah. a, an opportunity to like, show that this really happened, that right. this really happened to this person. And how can we put this person through going on camera and all of this unless it's gonna be, people will believe her and, right. and sh this happens to people. Like it became more like, we were mad and we just had to get it right. And so, and Etty at one point said, we'd say, Etty, I'm really sorry. Can we come over and film? I know this thing just happened. We need you to comment on it. And she would say, stop saying sorry. Don't ever say that again. You're gonna get this out there, right? Yes. So don't ever apologize again. Because otherwise, this is like, it happened, no one will ever It happened believe in this. a vacuum. Then, yeah. you know, nobody knows about it because all the stuff that she was dealing with has happened many, 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 many times. Mm -hmm. And because of the nature of this community and a lot of complicated reasons that you get a little bit of a sense of in the film, no one knows about. It's, you know, it's, it's an invisible injustice and um, this is the first time that anyone's even heard of this kind of injustice. It's so specific niche, yeah. and niche and um, archaic and it's the legal system and this, it's just, it's kind of crazy, it's crazy. And also, we had agreed with Etty that we wouldn't show her face, back to your original question, about we were gonna animate Etty um, and disguise her in some way, but we weren't exactly sure how. Which I should say, for people who haven't seen the film, does not happen. It does film. not happen. This was an early strategy. Yeah, and, and so we would shoot her face sometimes and her hair in the back of her head and then her hands, and then we had all these animation uh, tests of how we could disguise her and she agreed that her voice was okay but not so it was like we just took a leap of faith she took a leap of faith we took a leap of faith because we didn't really know how we were going to solve it but we were going to solve it it was that important to get the story out so we were flailing and shooting it all different kinds of ways and our poor cinematographers Alex Tockets and uh, Jenny Morello had to keep changing how we were doing things and it felt very uncomfortable. <laughs> We'd be like, her face, not her face, her hands, what do you, you know, I, I, and, and it was very discombobulating uh, for the process because uh, we didn't know what we were gonna do and at one point she decided, uh, I'm, I'd like to show my face, I will show my face, I, I, I'm, let's do this. And so then we, then we were able to orient ourselves and, and also show the audience the, what happened. So the first half of the film, you don't see her because that was the plan. And, uh, and that's how we shot it. And that's how we <laughs> shot it. So it was like we had to back into a lot of things visually. And, um, but, it, it, but it worked out. It was one of those things where you just, you know the story's important. You believe in the character. You might not have figured it out creatively yet. You just have to know that you will. And if you can't figure it out, you can get a team of people that can help you. But you, we just knew it was important enough to go with it. And we, Netflix, um, had gotten involved in the film um, by this point uh, after development, and we told them the same thing. We're like, we think we're going to animate, but please let's just not talk about it right now because we don't. It stresses us out. We don't really know. And they were like, okay, well, let us know when you figure it out. And eventually, Etty changed her mind. Let me uh, ask you this: Obviously, your editorial independence is uh, paramount uh, to you, and so when you're filming with people. Uh, who have so many other things at stake in their lives, you know, besides your film. I imagine that, that at some point along the process, you know, there's a dialogue going on. Are you going to put this in the film? Will the film uh, be like this? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, can you talk about how you conduct that uh, dialogue, you know, how you balance mm -hmm. reassuring someone that, that you're trying to take care of them, but without, freaking them out. well, without freaking them out and without giving up your own sure, take on sure. a... Well, the fact of the matter is that when you're filming someone, you film hundreds of hours <laughs> and movies end up being 90 minutes. Yeah. So you can't really tell anyone what's gonna be in the movie anyways. So the whole time, what I usually say is, we're working together on this we're, we don't know. We're gonna work, we're gonna do what's right for the film. And, and I promise you, you're gonna be cool with it. Yeah. And I, I, that, is, that is as honest as I can be. It's just the truth. Um, you know, editing takes 
minimum nine months and you're calling, calling, pulling, you know. And sometimes scenes that you're like, when you film them, you're like, there is no way possible that that will be relevant. Or there is no way possible that that's not gonna be the opening of the film. Then it is. But then you're wrong. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's, 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 that's the truth of the matter is like, I couldn't tell someone what's in and what's out. But sometimes people, it's, you know, it's, I guess, makes sense. People um, that you're filming get obsessed with details that you didn't notice, yeah. no one will care. Like, I mentioned my friend's uncle's name, he'll get really hurt, can you, and I was like, no, that won't be in the movie. Trust yeah, me. It's no true. One, no, the only character, out. we had one of our characters who kept asking about it was Ari. And Ari's 20, and Ari's a very meticulous individual. And um, he would say, listen, yesterday you guys were filming, and this girl called, and I think I said her name, and we're not really dating. And I, I don't want, she cannot, you cannot put that. And I was like... I don't even think we were rolling, but got it. I'll take a note. She will not be. Like the stuff that people actually worried about, or worry about often, lucky for us, are not the things that we're interested or, or, or in. Or completely irrelevant and only important to them so we can comfortably say, no problem. And that's not to say that when we show our films, now what we do is we finish the film and we before we do the color correct, when the film is done, we do not show rough cuts to our subjects. Um, we show the fi finished version and we, Rachel and I sit one by one with each, each subject alone in a room and we watch it together and then we talk about it. And, um, and as someone, that, you know, a lot of times there's uncomfortable moments. It's not like everyone just loves everything. Like, I don't, or, or I don't remember that you filmed that. I don't remember that day. And, I, you know, they don't, they're not thinking about that, that moment. And so there is a, a moment of shock and surprise and, and you know it's going to happen. And we just, we explain why we used it, why we think it's important. And as long as we haven't been inaccurate, um, then we manipulative or manipulative you know? or out of context, we, then it stays. So we've never actually changed anything right. based on a conversation with the subject because usually they understand and usually are relieved that we didn't mention the girl he was dating or whatever. You know, I mean, the, the details. So we've actually, I guess, been pretty lucky that our subjects have overall, oh, overall, been, overall been okay with it. Yeah. Let me ask you about a different situation. There are three people that you follow in this film. As I understand it, you filmed with more than <clears throat> just those three. Can you talk about that relationship of people who you've invested time in and who have invested time with you in their own way and, uh, and letting them know that they're not going to be in the film? Yeah. Oh, well, sometimes awkward. <laughs> but um, um, awkward, but sometimes they're relieved. I mean, you know, it's not... It's, that's the thing. There is, like, this is a, um, all of these things that you're asking about, relationships, there, there's no one version. It's incredibly um, flexible. There's so many things at stake in terms of your relationship, what you're, so there's no, there's no yes or no. So sometimes it's awful and awkward. Sometimes they're, they're really hurt. Um, sometimes they're relieved. Sometimes they say, great, can I help you with something? They say, great, you, have you met my sister? I mean, like, you just, you don't know. And people surprise you, which is why it's great to make documentaries, because people are always surprising you. But we've never filmed someone for, like, a year and dropped them. That's never happened. We, we are pretty, like, we, maybe we've filmed someone on and off for a few months. In this movie, a couple of months, right. like Mendy. And, right. um, and then we, we pretty much had, had known that this was, the story wasn't going anywhere. So we've never, like, had to tell someone after they've invested that much time, mm -hmm. to be honest. We're pretty good about... I hung on to a character in The Boys of Baraka too long. He was a reluctant subject, and uh, she was like, he doesn't want to do this. And I was like, but he's so... There's so much pathos. He's so expressive. I, I couldn't give him up. Um, and so we filmed him a little too long. It's also your first film, maybe. Our you first film, didn't I didn't know that we shouldn't do it. No, but we still it. make those mistakes. You yeah. still make the same mistakes. And, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. So we, when we dropped him, he was like really relieved, and I felt like an idiot because I was like, I really shouldn't have, like, I should have let him go a long time yeah. ago. So it happens. So, the kind of last part I want to ask you about <clears throat> is a little bit premature because this film only had its world premiere two nights ago. It's been seen by a few hundred people so far. <laughs> Uh, but is about to, you know, go out very wide um, a, a month from now. And 
Uh, and particularly this subject matter is one that I understand even after you put up the trailer is already you know, reverberating um, in the comments uh, section. So talk to me how you're preparing uh, for that. No, we have to. We have to go. We have to have a meeting about that. Yes, maybe you can help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you how just... about the town crier tonight? <laughs> uh, I mean, um, we certainly have talked about the um, the pitfalls throughout the entire process of what people could say or think or feel. I mean, we definitely think about our audiences when we're making movies. So, uh, you know, that is something that we care about. It's not just like, you know, it's, it's a weird balance. You know, um, you want to make the film that is important to you, that you care about, that you're proud of. But also, it's for other people. And you can't just make a movie for yourself because what's the point? So we, we're carefully thinking about and including in the film, you know, you have to synthesize what you really think and feel for an audience. So hopefully at the point where you're showing it, if they have a question, you have an answer because right. you've thought about it. Right, we've thought about every single frame. There's no mistaken frame in this movie, not one. This has been worked over and over and over. We've had the conversations. It's a difficult time. Uh, it's always a difficult time to make a film like this. And um, we, there's a lot of nuance in the movie. There's not a lot of nuance in the trailer. It's a great trailer. We love it. And it's, but there's a lot more well, nuance. The job of a trailer is to pull you in. The job of a trailer in. is yeah. to do what it does. And I love it. Yeah. Um, but when you see the movie, there's an incredible amount of nuance. And um, so I think if people just watch it, then there's a conversation to be had. The conversations we've had about preparation have been with our subjects to try to how are they gonna feel and who's gonna contact them and blocking comments and um, trying to like avoid the hate that's going to come their way from people in the community they're still in touch with. So all that conversation is happening and we're trying to prepare them and each, our, our help each other because now they're friends of ours. Um, and we wanna make sure that this experience is not negative for them because we don't like to uh, be part of the problem and like hurt someone's life. So that is really the conversation that we're trying to have is like how to brace yourself for many millions of people. It's going to go global October 20th in 160 countries. So this is a real, in all these languages. So people will try to contact them. And well, how do we deal with that? That is like the big conversation that we're having. We're fine. As, so uh, another factor in this mix is you know, this is a film ultimately about three individuals g going through something, but the, the backdrop to this is a uh, community, the Hasidic Jewish community, which in its very origins in, in America were, you know, fleeing uh, prejudice and hatred and, uh, and persecution. The, the highest version of anti-Semitism that exists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I, I wanna know, you know, how that has entered your thinking in, in the way you are representing the community here. Right. Well, we thought about it the whole time. I mean, uh, as a Jewish person, if I ever was responsible or involved or helped uh, perpetuate something negative to Jewish people, my grandmother would roll over in her grave. So, uh, you know, I can't do that like there's the grandmother factor yeah there's a grandmother factor <laughs> there's the you know responsibility to any group but that's not happening so that was that's just you know out of the out of the gate we made a film that hopefully people will be able to see that we transcend religion it's about being a black sheep it's about identity it's about loss it's about you know, um, willing to give everything up and the price of, you know, freedom, if you will. So, um, I, and I'm ready to have that conversation. I'm ready to have both of those conversations. But um, if you watch the film, I think that you will uh, get to experience the nuance that we struggled and worked really hard to show. We try to make a film that if you've never even met a Jewish person, it doesn't matter. You can identify with the struggles of these people. And we, we take the minuscule, the tiny community, the cul-de-sac in Jesus camp, 
and the, you know, the corner and 12th and Delaware. We take a tiny little sec piece and we try to make films that are universal. That's what we do. That's what we attempt and try to do with every one of our movies. This is no different. These are, this film is not about religion. It really isn't. It's, uh, it's about the price of, the, of individualism and the pitfalls of leaving the collective. Um, and hopefully that, that penetrates. And that is what we're talking about when, at the end of the film. And, but also and the benefits of being a collective. Also. Which is what makes it complicated. There is something incredibly uplifting about being held and protected. And we do hear from people in the film speaking to, to, to that. Sure. And we don't have that in secular society. We have our little, you know, if you're lucky, you have a wonderful group of friends and family. But nothing compares no. to the kind of community that the Hasidic community has. Nothing. You can't, you, you can't, we can't touch it. And while there's a price for that, um, it's, conditional. Also, it's conditional. It's conditional. It's still there's some incredible there's an incredible beauty to it if you can toe the line if you're happy within. And that's so, what we explored. Yeah, that's what we were. That's that's the meat that we're interested in. That's right. Well, well, I think you did an extraordinary job uh, with this film. That's why I wanted to start this uh, day getting into uh, the particulars of it. Uh, there's going to be another screening of one of us tonight. Do you guys no, know? No, today, today 1230. Oh, today 1230. They'd have to leave oh. the conference. Yeah, so well, just for it. two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Um, yeah, but it'll be on Netflix on uh, October 20th. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Okay, we're going to uh, take a little break while we reset the stage uh, before Geraldine Dreyfus, uh, one, a, a kind of angel investor. Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, Big comes time. Out. She was involved in our movie as well. So um, I know you'll want to hear from her. Thank you very much to Heidi thank, Ewing thank you. and Rachel Brady. Thank you for Brady. coming. It's a lot. Yeah.